Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life with Sabine Parza. Hi everybody, this is Sabine and I'm happy to be back with another episode of Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life. My guest today was Charlie Burton. Charlie and I, we met at an online discussion held by Tanzfabrik Berlin this winter. We have not met in person, but we had such an inspiring connection that I wanted to do a podcast with him, and I'm very glad I did. Charlie is a dramaturg, he is a choreographer, a teacher, a professional dancer, and a rehearsal director, but he's also an emergency and urgent care first responder. He is a sports therapist, a musculoskeletal health specialist, and a Pilates instructor, as well as a somatic practitioner in many different uh, methods. Charlie graduated from the Tring Park School for Performing Arts. He has formal training from the London Contemporary School. He has been a founding member of the English National Ballet Youth Company and is currently a dancer at the Russell Malefant Company. We talk about Russell Malefant's work, who is also, he's a professional choreographer, contemporary choreographer, who also works a lot with somatic practices. Charlie has an amazing range for his young age of trainings, of insights, of uh, looking at the intersectionality of art and health, of improvisation and technique. And that's exactly what we ended up talking about, sort of the big range that we have available at the fingertips if we allow ourselves to be open, to be improvisational, to not identify ourselves by one form or one profession even, to be fluid in our identity and to open up the space for our resources and for being in service to what is needed at the moment. So I hope you enjoy this podcast. I had a great time talking to Charlie. Hi everybody, this is Sabine. I'm super happy to be back here with another episode of Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life. My guest today is Charlie Britton. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Sabine. Nice to be here. Hi. Where are you? I'm in London at the moment, London, UK, um, in my flat in Whitechapel. Okay. Oh, great. Um, Charlie, you're one of the few guests that I haven't met in person yet. So mm. I'm super happy to talk to you. We met actually at an online conference uh, that uh, Tanzfabrik Berlin organized last winter. And we had a conversation about um, health and resilience. And I found myself connecting with you on a lot of topics that we shared during the mm. conversation. So I wanted to have a longer conversation with you. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. great. I, I found myself yeah. also intrigued by the by the connection. So it's nice to explore them a bit deeper. Yeah. Um, I read through your bio. Um, we have actually, before we start, we have one common denominator. Um, I don't know her for such a long time, but she's really close to my heart. And that's the person, Kirsty Simpson, who you also currently work with. That's, yeah. yeah. Kirsty's also very Kirstie? close to my heart. Kirsty um, and I started collaborating from probably about two years ago now, or, or maybe a little bit longer. We met at SEED, Salzburg Experimental Academy of Dance, where we're both um, guest teachers. And we happened completely by chance to be teaching in the same period. Um, and I was very intrigued by Kirsty's work and Kirsty's presence in faculty meetings and the kinds of perspectives that she she brought into our conversations as a wider team and we got talking more and more outside of the studio um, unfortunately because we were both teaching we weren't able to share each other's classes but we were talking more and more outside of of work really um, and again similar to yourself Sabine found out that we had lots in common lots of shared interests and lots of shared perspectives on on different topics in dance and also in health so it was a great first meeting and we stayed in touch since and then our collaboration developed more and more. Um, and yes, at, at Tanzfabrik in the winter, we delivered a, 
a collaborative workshop looking at kind of in, integrating health and well-being in, into dance um, and how the two interlink really and um, we're continuing our work more and more yeah that is if I read you if you read your bio you know I mean first of all when I read your bio I have two questions <laughs> one is <laughs> how old are you and the second <laughs> is, is do you have a private life <laughs> <laughs> because it's incredible uh, yeah. i mean the amount yeah. of studies the amount of work that you have done is just mind-blowing so i mean you don't have to answer these questions but... <laughs> yeah i mean it's a question that comes up fairly often for me i think um especially when i'm kind of teaching or contributing to things it's a good question um yeah i'm, I'm, I'm 26 um and my journey with studying alongside dance started very early really um so i would say that the, the the kind of two main pillars in my life being dance and and medicine or health I, i prefer the term health because i think my interest is in kind of the holistic side of it um although i do practice in kind of western medicine as well um so yeah they, they established themselves quite early on i think from, right from the age of maybe 13 or 14 i already had this fascination not just with the moving body but with the the way the body moved and the interaction of different anatomy and all those kind of things and I was very very lucky fortunate to be in a family environment and also in a dance environment that really nurtured that so it was something that just grew and grew um, and I then started to look more at formal study so I started to study physiology and anatomy more formally I think even from the age of sort of 15 or 16 I was already um, sort of deep deep into sort of uh, quite advanced studies of those subjects just just from a place of passion really and then one thing led to the other and unfortunately I was injured well I say unfortunately this is maybe an interesting topic to talk about later but you know I think it's easy to say unfortunately I was injured but in my experience and I think it's very linked to your question a lot of the reason I've done the things I've done has been about transforming injury or, or time as a result of injury that could be such a negative uh, place in terms of perception into something more positive and a lot of times that's been studying other things that I maybe wouldn't have had time for otherwise um, so yeah they've come together and in terms of having a private life I'm you know I'm not sure that's something that I'm facing more and more the older I get I'm starting to realize that maybe there's a there's a need for some rebalance especially as I as I delve deeper into holistic well-being I'm thinking wow I, I really need to be practicing what I preach and, and finding some downtime that isn't studying um, is probably quite a good place to start. Mm -hmm. It's very funny. You know, I'm I'm obviously in a different generation. I'm 51, so I'm also disclosing my age here. <laughs> and uh, I've also feel like I've been doing so much and I, I know I have been and I've been a mom and, you know, my kids are grown up now. Um, and the I think the interrelatedness of the arts and the health i like that you call it health and not medicine that there is a more of a holistic uh, aspect to it when we when we talk about health um it's so at the core of or has been at the core of my research and my investigation so i'm super happy to hear that there is somebody who starts his life already like that or that is already so present in your early years that's amazing and um, actually what you had, you mentioned something and I wanted to ask you is, is about your family background, if like both the arts or dance and or medicine, if there was one or the other in the foreground or if that was nurtured for you as a child. Yeah, um, it, it was, it was. And actually I, I find myself, I find it very difficult mm -hmm. when people ask me these questions when I give interviews or, or um, you know, I'm a guest speaker anywhere to not talk at some point about my my upbringing because it was it was really quite exceptional I would say um, I've got a mum who is a wonderfully nurturing and inspiring lady um, mm -hmm. who is a classically trained musician and then very early on um, became a, a teacher specializing in special educational needs and then very soon after that mm -hmm. became a music therapist a, a music psychotherapist so my mum's contribution to to kind of community and society has been been huge and, and really quite um, specialized in using music and, and intertwining that with well-being and you know psychotherapy so that's been a very big influence on my life I would say and very early on you know understanding that there were people in our communities with with different needs different perspectives different life experiences 
um, was incredibly value, valuable in itself. My dad is a, also a, a phenomenal musician. Um, he's a, a fantastic drummer and has played all sorts of different idioms of drumming, you know, jazz and pop and funk and, and rock. And he's, his, his journey with music also started very young and has been a huge um, yeah, driver in, in his life as well and, and therefore in mine. Um, and I grew up with a brother. So my brother is, is a few years older than me and is also went off to university and did a degree in songwriting and is now training as a play therapist, um, which I'm very excited about to, to kind of learn from him about his perspective on these things now. Um, so it was very nurtured as we grew up. And my brother also loved to dance as a young as a younger child. And, and that was really something that I looked up to. I think the health side was always a kind of holistic side from my mum's background. Um, my grandma, who was another huge inspiration in my life was a nurse. So I found myself very attracted to, to my, my grandma's experience of life and um, the kind of perspective that, that having that experience perhaps gave her, even if I didn't realise it at the time, when I reflect on it, I think that's probably one of the things that was most inspiring for me to hear about that experience. And, you know, I won't talk for too long about it, but if I think of my wider family, you know, my cousins are speech and language therapists or physiotherapists or um, you know, educators. So it's it's kind of this educational health arts theme is, is definitely something that is really at the heart of our family. I'm trying to imagine what it was like for you as a kid to be in your home. Like I'm trying to imagine the, I don't know, what, what instruments did your mom play? So she was a pianist and a cellist um, and we've got a, a beautiful uh -huh. grand piano in our living room which has been amazing you know ever since we were kids um all of my mum's siblings are also yeah. so i'm trying to imagine between the drumming and the, the <laughs> piano and the cellist i was yeah. married to a drummer once so i also okay. have to disclose that so yeah I, I know they play everywhere anywhere on anything um absolutely usually, right yeah you know, totally. we would be we would be yeah. at the diner and he would be doing his paradiddles on, on on a little you know napkin or something like that absolutely so i'm trying yeah. to picture you in this in this environment as a little kid and just soaking up all the information. Absolutely. It, it really was that. I mean, some of my most beautiful memories are kind of waking up and hearing my mum practicing something on the piano. And, you know, my dad would be, my dad would be in another room playing some kind of incredible jazz, practicing some kind of amazing jazz rudiment or something. And, you know, my brother would be on his guitar in his bedroom. So it was really a, a kind of quite an eclectic, but, but beautiful environment. And I think something that I've come out with is a, such a range of um, interest and appreciation of different kinds of music. And I think that that has actually expanded itself into all kinds of art, really. Um, so it's, yeah, it was, it was beautiful. Um, and we also grew up in a house that, a beautiful old house that my parents decided when my brother and I were still quite young to entirely renovate, you know, like not just paint the walls, but really knock walls down, build it up again, build a staircase from scratch. You know, it was really kind of like a building site. And, I think that as my parents have gotten a bit older, they've sort of thought, well, what kind of an upbringing was that? Was that, was that really tricky? But me and my brother are, are totally resolute in our feeling that it was the most creative environment. I mean, to lose yourself in, in play, you know, in your imagination, in your fantasy worlds, in an environment like that was just amazing. Um, so for me, it was, it was an in incredible privilege. Um, and I try and remind my parents of that when they're perhaps feeling a little bit not so sure whether that was the right choice. I think it certainly was, but that coupled with the music and the dancing and, you know, having parents and grandparents that were so hands-on and so willing to entertain it and, and participate in it was, was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if I look at my own life or if I, you know, I teach a lot of teachers and I, I coach a lot of people in their process. And one of the things I'm always recognizing also from my own story um, I mean, my my mom was a teacher and my dad was um, in in gastronomy, so in the restaurant business. So there weren't necessarily artists, but they were in the business of hosting and teaching, like hosting in the sense of making people feel comfortable, um, making, you know, the sensual element of food. And also the pedagogy, the teaching was always, I mean, I just kind of soaked that up. I don't, you know. It was never something that my mom taught me directly, but I, I just got a lot of information on that. But the arts part was kind of dormant with both of them. I think they would have been great artists, but they never actually 
pursued that very much. And then so I recognized within myself to define myself as an artist was always a bigger step than defining myself, let's say, as a teacher. Teacher was always like, yeah, you know, I know, I, I know that. And I also see that with a lot of people who are, you know, am I an artist? What does that mean to be an artist? Am I allowed to to goof around with any material if it's sound or or drawing or or, or dancing? And if 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 there has been a background, it it often takes only one person in the family or in the environment as a, as a child. If there has been one person who has identified as an artist then it usually is easier for us to step into that realm and say, yeah, it's okay. It's okay to not know and to go into the unknown and to play and to take this seriously what I am doing. And obviously that has been prevalent for you. And it's, it's amazing to see, you know, the outcome, at least, you know, I don't know you, but <laughs> the outcome <laughs> just in terms of yeah. the range that you have at such an early age. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it certainly was. And, and what came hand in hand with that, you know, in my kind of early school career was was parents that were so um, passionate about our passion, if that makes sense. You know, the, their passion really was, we don't mind if you become an accountant or work in a shop or work for a charity or become an artist. You know, it didn't matter. What mattered that it was that we were healthy and we were we were fascinated and curious. And it was those kind of things that I think were really um, encouraged and, and nurtured and that's kind of set me up for life, really, having that experience as a, as a child, because my passion was always learning from a young age. So actually, I didn't matter if I was learning history or movement or science. I loved the, the process of learning, of, of gaining, gaining understanding and perspectives. And, and that was always really encouraged. And yeah, I think I'm, I've got so much more to thank my parents for than my education. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that was one of the aspects that I wanted to talk to you about, because if we're looking, if we're looking even just like if we're just taking dance, um, what I'm gathering of your career just as a dancer and a choreographer is, is that did you start training as a ballet dancer or you were definitely dancing ballet at one point professionally yes. in your life? But what was the yeah. what was the beginning like in terms of technique? Um, from when I started taking dance more seriously, um as a professional or semi-professional training. Yeah. So I started dancing very young, um, just in a really creative way. So just once per week in an evening, and it was just all about the social side, all about the enjoyment, all about the musicality. That was really the focus. It was, it was, there was How no technical you? training when at all. Started? I think, yeah. I think How I was about you? three. I think I was about three or four, yeah. maybe. Um, very young and it was all awesome. about enjoyment didn't even realize it was a career didn't even realize I just loved the music I loved the rhythm I loved the expressiveness it was just wonderful um, and I did that for many many years it was it wasn't until I was you know into my teenage years that I started to take dance more seriously and um, I started I was very lucky that I had this wonderful teacher um, Ang Harrod Hughes who I went to after that creative experience and kept nurturing my creativity, but also started to embed some really good technique. So I started to do a bit more ballet. I started to do contemporary from a technical perspective, which I didn't hadn't experienced before. And I was very lucky to be accepted onto a summer school, which was being hosted by English National Ballet. Um, and there's a story there about my um, I was a very nervous kid really I was I was quite worried if I thought I was going to let anyone down that was probably the the number one thing that would stress me out and and I'd missed the deadline because I'd just not seen it early enough and I was I was very 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 anxious about applying and my parents somehow probably over a series of hours managed to gently persuade me that it was okay and we should go for it anyway and I'm, I'm so glad they did because I ended up getting into this summer school um and I had a I had a quandary because there was a contemporary strand and a ballet strand and the contemporary teacher, Helen Parler, was phenomenal. And it was my first time seeing someone dance in that way, in that in that with that sense of flow and fluidity and embodiment and and deep listening to the body. And I was just captivated. But on the other hand, the host was English National Ballet and it felt like an opportunity not to be missed that, um, you know, a company like that would come to this sort of regional um, theatre and deliver something. So I ended up choosing ballet and I met a really wonderful teacher, uh, Laura Harvey, who worked for International Ballet um, as a creative associate at that time. 
and she was very lovely and came and spoke to my parents afterwards and encouraged me to get into London. So I started training at the Rombert, Rombert Dance Company on their youth programme at the time. And then Youth National Ballet launched their youth company. And I was still a teenager at this point. I hadn't gone to full time training. I was training part time at the place and part time at Rombert. And um, they launched this youth company and I went for it. And that was my kind of way in, really. So I started dancing for the International Ballet Youth Company. And that had some really uh, kind of heavy duty ballet technique. Um, so I started getting a propensity towards ballet, studying it more and more seriously and trying to understand more about the technique. And I would say at the time, I maybe wasn't so sure of this, but looking back, my passion was still wholeheartedly in explorative dance, contemporary dance. But I think at the time I was so encouraged that if I could get access to a classical training, I should, that it would set me up well. So I went down that route and I, I went to train at, in a classical um, in a classical school for two years um, when I was 16. Yeah. And it also sounds that the national, um, that the school itself had an openness towards the contemporary dance, which, you know, depends also in terms of the time frame of when a ballet school or when a ballet company to, you know, when you study with them, that it also depends on their general sort of openness towards it. I mean, there are some ballet companies who work very contemporarily, but um, at the base of it, it's ballet or the technique is ballet. And then, but they have an openness towards it. And it's just, I mean, if we're getting into the holistic aspect of it, it's just, you know, how, how people are being treated or how um, open-minded it, you know, ballet can become, or if, it, if it's just more of a, uh, um, you know, a healthy approach also to dancing. I don't know if that was the case with the company, but, you know, I know that from so many uh, colleagues of mine and friends of mine, and even, you know, we had the scandal here in Vienna at the Vienna State Opera School just a few years ago where a friend of mine was actually, she was, um, she was, she, uh, her name is Sharon Booth. I don't know if you know her. I did an interview with her as well, and she was teaching there. And she was just appalled at the situation, at the classical Russian training and the, the treatment of the children. So I hope you had a better time at your school than some of these traditional ballet schools. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's a, it's a really good point to make. And I think that, you know, at the time it was it was so exciting to be, even just to be in full-time training of anything. You know, I'd, I'd kind of had my sights set on it for, for quite a few years before it happened, you know. And although I still loved learning and I was lucky enough to still be doing well at school, um, it wasn't my it wasn't where my my gut and my heart were really dragging me. And, and once I got into that environment and I was able to just be absorbed in dance all day, every day, I was I was in seventh heaven, you know, and I was lucky that the school I went to, although it was kind of renowned for having a very um, high level classical training, they also had a contemporary department, they also had a jazz department. So the training was was kind of broad, even though it was a very technical training. Um, and, you know, there were definitely elements of cl classicism in terms of mindset and, and methodology. And I would say in terms of the way that the school was established, the way it was organised, the way that they interacted with their students, there were definitely things that I would uh, very much like to to kind of veer away from and I have done in my own teaching practice and, and I would like us to do more I think um, as an industry in general but overall that you know the technical training was was fantastic and and I learned a lot from being in that environment I'm just very glad and somewhat humbled to have been someone that could get through that intensity of training and and was lucky enough to find practice principles and people to support me to unpick some of the stuff that perhaps wasn't so healthy that I picked up, you know. And it, doesn't, it didn't ruin your love for dancing, which often happens, especially when kids are young and they're put in a very classical setting or in a very disciplined setting. It sounds like you were able to extract what you needed, which is the technique of it, and then still find yourself independent with your passion, with your interest to take it and to use it, which of course is the basis for for any professional dance you're dancing with um russell Melephant, i read russell russell Melephant's company and what and from what i gather it's quite is i i don't i have to admit i don't know his work it looks beautiful but it also looks like it has a wide range in terms of 
technical, contemporary, and or improvisation? How do you guys work? Yeah, it's um, it's a been a fantastic experience for me actually working with Russell. Um, and it's interesting. I think it's nice the introduction we had because I think you know you'll, you'll see the parallels. But Russell comes from a background in Rolfing, uh, uh, IDP Rolf's technique of bodywork, and worked to, worked as a ballet dancer, um, very accomplished ballet dancer in the Royal Ballet um, for many years before. Um, getting more and more intrigued by improvisation, contact improvisation, and, and studied such an array of of different approaches to movement, you know, Tai Chi and um, different elements of martial arts, capoeira, contact improvisation, as I've said, contemporary techniques, and um, then started to be really fascinated by choreography um, and became a maker from that point, really, and, and hasn't stopped since. So the company's been running, I think it's in its 26th year, um, but Russell was creating work before that point, but the company as an established entity has had this really beautiful heritage. And what I love about working with Russell is he shares so many of my interests beyond dance. And what's great is that he brings them firmly into dance. So they're not separate. You know, he's also studying at a very high level things like biomechanics, you know, fascial techniques. Um, you know, he studied yoga in the past. He's studying a lot with um, teachers that I'm also working with, th people like Gary Ward, David Gray, who have a very um, integrated approach to the body and movement. And they're really interested in in the way that the body works in health and restoring movement, um, which is interesting and, and somehow quite different. I, I would say from my personal experience from a kind of classical physiotherapeutic approach, which is based often on quite... Um, quite isolated approaches you know if you have a knee injury you treat the knee whereas what I like about um, Russell and and what I really love about the way that fascia has affected our practice as health practitioners is really that I don't I don't believe that biomechanically or in terms of health we can isolate the body you know um, the knee might be the manifestation of that pain it might be the manifestation of that dysfunction but it's only going to be the cause of it, the, the true primary cause of it sometimes, you know, so we need to look holistically. And, and what Russell does from an artistic point of view, as well as from a kind of technical point of view, is exactly that, you know, looking at how the body can work in the most healthy, um, embodied way, you know, in the way that the body is the most robust and resilient and accessible. Um, but he's also fascinated by the implication that has on the aesthetics of dancing. So. For me, it's kind of a perfect balance between working within dance and expression and and technique and you know in a very in a very physical way. You know, the company's work is is, ve is highly physical, but the practice we do every day that Russell leads is very much about how we support that and how we unlock it in a holistic way, rather than kind of pushing into it without that support. So it's been fascinating, and it's the first time I've been in a dance environment. Oh my environment god, someone... my heart, my heart is just going. <laughs> I know, I know. Mine, mine does too. Mine does too. And it's been yeah. so great for me personally well, you because know, it's been the first time to work with someone like that. Yeah. 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 Because, you know, in terms of my history, I mean, I studied in the US and I danced professionally in Chicago. And, uh, you know, back then, I mean, it was the 90s. Yeah. There was, and it's still prevalent in, in many ways, but just to hear that company work is also involving. Yeah. It was so traumatic. Like I love dancing, but it was so traumatic to do company work because it's so, it's so geared towards an artistic director's ego. And it was so, I mean, it's, you know, that was 30 years ago and it, you know, Feldenkrais and yoga and Klein work were just beginning to infiltrate the practice. But when I, what I hear is, is that it there, or what I've experienced over the years and so much of what I do in my work is try to combine the artistic work and the holistic somatic work and the healing and the body work, you know, that's at the core of my research for all these years. And then to hear that somebody is doing artistic work from that basis and that you get to be in it. That's awesome. It, it is. <laughs> it's it's totally to awesome. It, it really is. Setting. It's, f mm. it's fantastic. And, you know, yeah. for me, it was a it was an interesting moment when I met Russell because I was um, sort of at a chapter of life where I was thinking, you know, do I need to go in one direction or the other? Um, and I'm, I'm firmly in the camp that I, that I don't. Actually, I think what's what's so interesting for me now is the connectedness and the way that those different different areas of my practice link. That's what fascinates me. 
but there's a lot of conditioning that if you if you're not all or nothing in dance you'll never make it and if you're not all or nothing in health you'll never make it so for me I had a long process of trying to understand that it wasn't really my voice up here that was that was suggesting that it was really absorbed voices from what I'd been told or what I'd been um yeah like suggested so when I met Russell it was amazing to, to be in a room dancing you know full time but with someone that was equally fascinated in everything else and um Russell is all about the work you know he's so fascinated by the process the inquiry the question and you see that not just in the artistic work that we produce but really in the approach you know in the way we make work but also in the practice that Russell's developed over so many years and and he's a very generous teacher and a very generous um, collaborator in terms of sharing his knowledge you know he's not interested in in keeping it to himself and and that's a real privilege just that is a privilege but then when the work is so aligned to my own interests it's just a wonderful environment to be part of mm -hmm. and you know part of what I mean I from the inside I'm interested in that but also as an audience member like for me when I go see dance and I don't go to see it very often anymore I, I am always reminded of what are the conditions that this piece of art is being created under. Yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't, that's not only about dance, you know, it's about music as well, but to get a sense of ease or to get a sense of well, like health basically. Yeah. To have a sense that, that, and I just glimpsed at some of his choreography online before we started with our podcast. But there was an organicness about the movement and a sense of breath and a sense of groundedness that um, that's what I want to see as an audience member. I want to go and feel good when I come out of a, a dance performance. And so many times when I go, I just I feel stifled. I feel, you know, my spine is kind of going like that. My my breath is held up and I don't want to do that anymore. So I feel like that that. Um, it's not a responsibility, but it's a choice to make also what are we like, what kind of field are we offering for our audience members to to invite them into? And if it's a if it's it's a if it's a breathing field or if it's a grounding field, and then I can also communicate something to my audience members, which that, that would actually be the aim, right? To not pass on my neurosis, but hopefully pass on some of my resilience or my my breath or my my relationship to the ground which as dancers of course that's what we spend so much time on yeah oh, I, I couldn't I'm agree more right now <laughs> yeah great me too yeah I completely agree I completely agree and it's what I think what's amazing as well is to see dance of that caliber like physically you know it's incredibly physical work but but not at the expense of the body. You know, if we're doing extreme movements, we're doing extreme movements with an understanding of biomechanics or with an understanding of um, tensegrity, you know, spreading load through a, through a wide chain to avoid pinch points. You know, there's so many, there's so many kind of principles that, we're, that we embody. Um, and, you know, that, that's a really, I think it's really exciting for me to see dance that can be that expressive and that physical, but not at the expense of, of of people's health really um and it's funny because it's you know there's there's some of the work that i've danced for russell has been some of the most intense i've done and my body's not never felt better you know in lots of ways um so it's it's a really interesting thing and i i you know from my interest i often think well how much of that what are the different layers that contribute to that and i think that the cultivation of a of a space and an environment and a and an approach you know a, a how question rather than a what question I think that's something that in my, my well, in my making practice and my teaching practice is, is kind of really high up my priority list. Um, and I see that with Russell as well, but I don't see it so often or as maybe not as often as I would personally like um, in some other practices. Yeah. And I think what um, I lost my train of thought here, but yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, what I wanted to say is, is that it doesn't exclude the technique. I think that's what, you know, like in the 90s, I felt like I had to make a choice, either either be a technical dancer or 
or find myself in relationship to the ground or in a free flow or with improvisation. And, I, you know, that was the time and that was my personal life also. But it sounds like or that is actually where my heart also goes. It doesn't exclude performance. It doesn't exclude also really working with your all of your skills as a dancer, as a technical dancer. And you can use the ballet, the ballet technique, or you can use the skill of choreographing and still have a relationship and still have a uh, a field of communication within yourself and within with each other yeah we use it in many different ways you know mm -hmm. so if i look at you again charlie where you are in your lo young life that has already been so rich and full like where is your where's your main interest at at the moment like where I mean, do you, maybe it's many things at the same time, but if you say, okay, this is the topic that that's at the core of my research yeah. right now, where, where are you at? I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good time to ask me this question, I think, because I've been thinking about it for a while. Um, I, yeah, I think that the last few years, really, I've started to, I mean, I alluded to it earlier in our conversation, talking about how all the different elements in my life, in my, in my practice and in my interest kind of interlink and, and what, what's the core of it? You know, I was trying to think what's, what's underneath it or what's the, what's the interest and how is the interest over here similar to the one over here, you know, and I tried to start peeling back layers more and more and, and it was, it was a natural process, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't a neurotic process of kind of really interrogating it intellectually. I was just trying to listen deeper and deeper over time to what it really was that got me in the room. What, what was it about leaving that workshop that made me feel so alive and so interested and so curious? And what was it about that performance or that patient, you know? And I think at the moment, what I'm really interested in is, is in, is in kind of the how question. Um, and I'd say that's really on the artistic side. I'm, I'm so much more interested at the moment in how and why we're doing things than, than what. And I think my teaching practice kind of encapsulates that probably most concretely. Um, I think that over the last few years, the, the content of my classes, my workshops, my, my sharings have been becoming more and more secondary to how, you know, my, my interest in holding space, creating, creating an environment in, you know, trying to channel and, and offer values into a room or an exchange has become so much more of a priority for me than the exact content that we might do. So it becomes that the material of the class or the workshop has become a kind of vehicle to either explore principles, to, to inquire about different questions, um, to be curious rather than as the, the aim of the outcome. You know, it's not become, it maybe would have been, what do I want these students to leave having learned? And I might have said handstand or inversion, you know, whereas now I'm, I'm kind of trying to deconstruct my practice at, on all the levels and say, what is it that a handstand is useful for? You know, and you can say it's useful because in 10 years they might be in a job where they need it. But for me, I'm much more inspired these days in, in well, what is it? Does, it? does it ask for the student to be courageous because it's an area that they've not explored before? Is it that there's a barrier to them being inverted? And so it's an opportunity to understand, um, you know, their, their approach to different barriers or, you know, their, their willingness to take risk. Is it about their cultivating a space that they feel safe to be vulnerable? And that actually inversion is a great way to um, explore that vulnerability in a way that's still held, you know. So I'd say the how question is, is, is a big one. And also thinking about what it is for me personally that interests me. And I think that it comes down to this base question of, of humanity and connectedness. And what are the kind of core values in my life that I can explore or share in all the different areas of my practice. Um, and those are, those are things like, you know, compassion or curiosity or creativity or courage, you know, calmness, uh, comedy to a certain extent, you know, I'm not interested in being a comedian, but I think a sense of, I think a sense of humor goes a long way, especially in the kind of intense environments that we might find ourselves in as, as artists or as health practitioners, you know? Um, so I'd, I'd say that the question at the core of my research at the moment is really, what are the underlying principles? What are the underlying topics that unify all the different outlets that I do? And how can I really use those different manifestations to listen to different bits? You know, I can listen to a different part of the question as an educator, as a pedagogue, than I can as, a, as an emergency 
medic and I can listen to a different bit of the conversation as an emergency medic than I can as a as a body worker you know and I, I think that the sustenance for my practice the kind of the 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 lifeblood of it the thing that keeps it transforming is really trying to listen to those deeper questions um, and use those different areas of my practice as a way to hone in but also then zone out you know hmm. beautiful I, I can share this with you since we don't know each other all that well. Um, I can share, you know, I was I was an artist and I came back for many years in the States and then I came back and then I started working at a rehabilitation center here in Austria. And uh, I had training, but I wasn't prepared <laughs> for what was about to come. And what I ended up doing is I was looking for the principles underneath. And I mean, the rehabilitation center was for people after severe accidents. So it, it was an insurance company for um, for work accidents, but it also counted the uh, the way to work, like the travel to work. So there was a lot of car accidents or traffic accidents as well involved. And so we had people, but there was also some psychiatric patients. And so it was a wide range of um of life situations and, and injuries that people were in. And it was often combined with a psychiatric diagnosis or uh, a neurological disease or just multi, you know, polydrama and lots of, lots of brain injuries, of course, um, spinal cord injuries and, and brain injuries. And what I found myself doing, I worked there for 14 years. And what I found myself doing there as an artist, as a dancer, I was looking for the underlying principles of what unites movement across the board, across being a professional dancer, me going in there, not being really ready for it, but figuring it out and then seeing that everybody has a different story. Everybody has a different body, of course. Everybody has a different uh, injury because there's no accident is the same. No angle of a car is hitting another car at the same and then the body inside that is being traumatized by that hit. And then every aftercare is not the same and every recovery is not the same. You know, the amount of resources that people have available in terms of their internal access to the rehabilitation process, but also the physical rehabilitation, you know, so it's never the same. So to look underneath and to say, okay, what's at work here? What's, what's, um, you know, and I think that comes back to what you said before is, is where's the humanity in this? Where's the compassion? Where's the humor? Where's the creativity? And where's this level of meeting each other where I don't have a solution as a dance therapist here, but I can offer you something and then we'll see how it goes. Basically, <laughs> we'll see what, what that where do we meet each other right there mm. so that it sounds amazing that's, that's you beautiful about, hmm. yeah it's so special to hear that and, and I, then I, what I, I, ended I can up, relate and then on so what many I layers ended up doing is, yeah there's so many layers in there and then of course what happened is is because i worked at the rehab center and then you know i had my kids and i kind of dropped out of dancing for a while because i was kind of you know, done with the business or tired of the business. And then I got back into dancing. And then, of course, having like honed into this very detail of what's at the core of it, I could apply that and use that again in the professional dance. Absolutely. I mean, this is the magic for incredible. me. This is this is so important, isn't it? And actually, I think that, you know, what I've just described so much from an artistic perspective is almost totally really from the health perspective because it wasn't until I became a sports therapist and I was looking you know I was I was learning and studying and, and kind of investigating well what is it that makes this client get better and this client not or this client you know holds on to their pain as an identity this client doesn't you know I was it, it was seeing you know volumes of clients but also my my education as a therapist and, and that went on and on really I I you know, I signed up for one course and, and loved it and was like, well, I need the next bit and the next bit and the next bit. And, you know, what you opened with, which is all of these different things that, that I've, I've been lucky enough to kind of go through in terms of training has been always from intrigue. You know, I'm always thinking, well, what's that next little bit of the puzzle going to add or, or 
and maybe it's a contrast maybe these bits of the puzzle kind of disagree but actually that could be interesting as well because if I've got a client maybe this one is perfect for them and this is perfect for another you know but I think what you're saying about the process you know from from my understanding of what you've said like you're really describing the process you know we can't be I don't believe I can get anywhere near as deep or as far with an outcome driven process because if I want to get someone from A to B whether that's a student a client a compositional work you know a choreographic process whatever that might be if I've decided where it needs to go I've immediately put a, a barrier in place because it's it's an it's an it's a decision made in in the future you know and as soon as I'm sat in the future I'm not in the present moment and and in the present moment there are limitless possibilities you know and I think this is something I love about improvisation, you know, that, that actually the, the, the aim and the, and the beauty is in the listening because it's an exception. It's kind of a radical process of acceptance. You know, you don't know what the next moment will be, but you're stepping into it, you know, and, and that's a really beautiful way. And, and I hear that in what you're saying. And I think to reflect in my own practice, it's all about that process. You know, it's, it's about scaffolding a journey and experience and using that experience as a kind of as a basis to learn from you know, through experiential learning, embodied learning, whatever, whatever the focus is for that environment, rather than having a prescription of, I'd like you to know this, you know, because as you said, everybody's got a different body, everybody's got a different experience, everybody's got different factors, internal factors, external factors, societal factors, generational factors, you know, this, you, you could go on. And, and, you know, that's so, that's really um, prevalent in health you see it very clearly when you're dealing with someone that's been through a physical or a psychological insult you see it immediately I don't think that we look at that enough when we look at dancers or artists or students of dance I think that we should have my, my, my belief and my interest and my excitement is in applying the same thing you know I, I want to scaffold an environment I want to give enough that I can facilitate a journey but not so much that I constrict the learning, you know, and finding that balance, that meeting point, as you really beautifully described it, between saying, have a look over here, have a look over here, maybe this would be interesting, but leaving enough autonomy that actually the passion for me, if I do that well, and it's a constant, it's a constant balance, I'm not at all suggesting that I do, but it's an interest in me becoming better and better at, can I help scaffold people to learn how to learn? I think that's the goal. That's the biggest priority I have at the moment in all of my artistic work is if I can teach you how to learn, if I can help you understand how you best learn, if I can help you to be reflective, if I can help you to be a good communicator, if I can help you to be a bit more in touch with your self-talk, with your mindset, with your, you know, with your barriers, then that's something that will unfold beyond the workshop, beyond the degree, beyond the whatever it might be you're doing. And that's for me what's so exciting you know, um, rather than thinking about a content, content led process. Yeah. Yeah. So Charlie, I'm going to be a little bit provocative here, but because I'm also really interested in that. Now, of course, when you are in emergency care, you're not going to go into process with somebody when it's about life and death at the moment. So, <laughs> right. So I'm wondering, absolutely right. Right. You need stability, you need safety, you need, you know, essential, essential life care at this moment. So I'm wondering how your resources, your abilities that you might use in, you know, when you have more time, when you have a more relaxed setting in sports therapy or even in the creative process, how do these interact with uh, a life or death situation or an really an emergent yeah, care yeah. situation? That is a, that's a, a fantastic question. And I think I'll maybe try and answer in kind of two avenues, if that's OK. Um, the first in, in the real in the real practical moment of the emergency, you know, and, 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 and taking into account somehow the, the, the responsibility you have as a clinician to to treat this patient, to identify rapidly what's wrong with them, to do everything you can to intervene with that process, either to facilitate them getting definitive treatment in a hospital or from an advanced care team or something like that. If I think about that moment, I think what it's done for me, um, the other side, the dancing side, the sports therapy side has given me skills. And I don't say this lightly because I know that to people that exist maybe in one or the other, I can imagine, I can empathize with the idea that it's very difficult to think that this is a genuine belief, but I, it really is. And what I think is that being able to, um, being able to do well under pressure, 
being able to think critically, rapidly, being able to prioritise information in a way that is um, got a very clear definition of what the priority is in this moment, you know, being able to empathise with someone, even in a situation which is incredibly heated, being able to offer someone care and compassion, even when you're limited in the concrete intervention that you can make in their process or in their journey as a patient. Those are skills that I would say dance taught me much more eloquently than medicine did. Um, you know, the, the, the emergency training that I received delivered the drugs, it delivered the examination, it delivered the, you know, the different pathways of care, it delivered a lot about how to intervene, when to intervene. And it, to some degree, empowers you as, a, as an autonomous thinker. You know, you, you, you know that there will come a point in your education or in your practice that, that you are the person, actually. It's not going to be your mentor and it's not going to be your educator. It's going to be you at some point that has to make that decision of do we or don't we, you know. So I would say that all of those skills really dance taught me that. Dance taught me how to function under pressure. Dance taught me how to communicate calmly, compassionately with a team. And if that team is trying to manage a critically unwell patient, there's no space for incivility because as soon as you have, um, as soon as you have a situation where you're not communicating incredibly clearly, so you know, directly, clearly, and concisely, but in a way that it's very clear the patient is the priority and, and it's not a personal, um, it's not a negatively personal relationship. Dance told me that. And so I'd say that's no, and there's the no thing. room. Yeah, and there's no room for insecurity at this point. You're going to have to get into your directing mode. You do this, you do that. You're going to have to get into, I mean, what it sounds like is, is it's a performance state. It's a, a high adrenaline performance state. This is what it's needed. You need to make a decision. You need to be clear about where you are and accommodating the situation. So uh, uh, a physical presence is needed. And, and, and the amount of pressure that you have in that moment also... It, you know, there's a there's a clear purpose of what's at what what the focus is at hand. So you also put yourself aside, and you just go into action. And I I it's love that. I mean, I that. love it's that. absolutely that. Yeah, yeah. And I love that you have language for that. That that dance has taught you some of these skills from your performance quality, from your improvisational qualities to be to be present for somebody else in such an emergency. Uh, absolutely, situation. absolutely. Think, it's. It's really that. And I think that, um, you know, the communicative state, you know, even the thing like you said about your physical presence, you know, if you've got a patient that is going through probably one of the most um, tra potentially traumatic or at least emotionally intense experiences of their life, um, you know, you've got that patient, you've also got their network. If it's a child, you've got their parents or their carers. If it's an, if it's a, an adult, you've got their family members or their loved one or their, or their husband, wife, children, you know, you're trying to again, hold a space, create an environment that doesn't in any way diminish the, the gravity of what they're going through, but does offer a, a safe space for them to ask questions, feel heard, feel seen. And, and your physical presence is, is vital, you know, being on that level with a patient, making eye contact, being open in your chest, you know, there are things that if I went into a room full of emergency medics or, or paramedics or emergency medical technicians and said, have you thought about this, you know, uh, maybe they'd been on a had a few hours of education about you know your posture is important you know but it wouldn't be to the level or to the degree that we go through that in dance and I think that's one of the most essential skills we've got really is understanding what kind of a presence and what kind of a um yeah what we invest in our patients in the way that we hold ourselves is, is vital you know the perspective of weight you know the 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 weight that's given in emergency training to things like your your posture, your body language, your resource management, you know, it's mm -hmm. always done from a very concrete place. And I think in dance, we, we investigate that, we inquire about those things in a much richer way, in a much more nuanced way. And there's something about those skills mm -hmm. that, that makes such a difference. And I often tell, well, as many people as I can really, um, that so much of what we do, I, I, I genuinely believe the majority of what we do, even in emergency care, um, is, is really about your soft skills. It's about your ability to create a relationship with your patient. It's about your ability to be reassuring, but also honest, you know, reassuring with integrity. It's about your ability to have difficult conversations mm -hmm. from a place of compassion. Um, there's so much to it. And mm -hmm. it's also about the concrete skills of resource management, performing under pressure, being able to appraise 
situations and come up with in, in lots of times quite creative solutions. You know, there are there are very strict algorithms mm -hmm. and guidelines on the hardcore, you know, the very the very sort of condition led medicine. But, you know, you go to a patient and they're three stories up stuck in the bathroom and, you know, you need to get them to hospital. That's a creative situation. Mm -hmm. That's a situation of how do we do the best we can with what we've got in this moment? And that is very much like performing mm -hmm. or like improvising, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say those mm -hmm. communicative skills, those problem solving things, those those things about using resources and also being able to keep a clear head. You know, if you've got a 12 or 13 step um, protocol to go through for this patient's condition, um, and, the, and I would say in my experience, mm -hmm. you know, the, the more life threatening the situation, the more strict the guideline. You know, if you go to a kayak arrest, you know, it, it's very clear what you do when. But you're never going to be able to execute that in a calm, kind of in a, in a way that's calm and collected and, and accurate if you can't stay calm. And being calm under pressure is something mm -hmm. that performing or teaching has taught me resource management is something that being a rehearsal director and a, and a, and a pedagogue has taught me, you know, all of those different things, they interlink, but I think you have to be someone that's curious about the links to see them. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up yeah. here. But the other thing I would say is that from my experience in holistic wellbeing, I think people find it difficult sometimes to, to link the dots between why I work so holistically and so multi in such a multifaceted way in my sports therapy, you know, body work, integrative health practice. And yet I work in emergency care in the kind of really medical practice. And for me, what's interesting is that my, my belief and what the research tells us from an evidence based perspective, but also what what kind of more traditional techniques like Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine teach us. The intersection between those three things really is that so much of our modern disease processes are chronic and chronic disease almost always in my experience and somewhat to some degree backed up by the research originates from stress so if it was if my interest had stayed in cardiology or in neurology or in gastroenterology you know different areas of medicine so much of what we're facing in other areas of medicine today is a kind of pandemic of chronic disease a pandemic of stress induced disease and in those contexts my passion for holistic medicine my passion for looking at a person holistically psychological factors social factors dietary factors you know um all sorts of factors movement you know medicine yes but as one of many factors that affect our overall health and well-being that's where my passion comes in for those kind of problems the thing that we are yeah. um, we see less often in emergency medicine are those conditions you know we see exacerbations of chronic di diseases but we're not responsible for managing them long term because i think if we were then i would be very much more interested and more excited to be managing them holistically than from a purely western perspective yeah. and that's not to say that western yeah. medicine isn't effective yeah. in managing them of course it is um but i believe that it should be considered as one facet of many um rather than the other. So being in emergency care somehow makes that decision easier for me because as you say, in, in a life and death situation, it's very, very clear and concrete what we're, what we're doing. Mm. Mm. Fascinating, fascinating. So, I mean, yeah. it, maybe just to wrap our session up here, the last point for me in some ways, and I, I'm, I'm improvising here. <laughs> Yeah. Is sure. In some ways, I feel like it's about letting go of identity. I mean, if it's, you know, if I'm identified as a body worker or if I'm identified as a dancer or as an artist, or if I'm identified as a Western medicine practitioner or as a complementary practitioner in mm. so many ways for me, or, you know, like you said, also, what I've experienced uh, with patients or even with participants or even with myself, the moment I hold on to a identity, I get stuck. If I believe I know who I am, either as a practitioner or as a person, I end up getting stuck. And of course, it's a very human thing to do because we try to define ourselves and we try to also further ourselves and we have to promote ourselves in a way also so that we have to put some words to it. But I yeah. think maybe the, the gift of 
of the of the intersectionality of bringing together many different forms is letting go of identity and opening up the container also to something that what you said earlier and letting spirit in or letting life in or whatever you call that yeah, yeah the energy the resource the light mm. you know whatever whatever fits you best whatever doesn't sound too esoteric to you yeah. but where yeah. we can you know creating containers for this amazing body for this amazing body mind spirit life energy and then for the conditions in that certain environment with these other people at that certain moment to mm. to to create it in a way that i'm not holding on to myself and my own ego intentions here but i'm using my resources to interact and to collaborate for the best of the outcome of for the most people or for whoever is in the focus right now okay Absolutely. so that was a convoluted sentence but i was trying it was, my it best was beautiful <laughs> yeah no it was it was beautiful and and yeah i my I, I feel very similarly to that to be honest um i think that the more i do yeah the more i try and visualize i try and really deconstruct the um the skills or approaches or methodologies that i've been lucky enough to kind of be gifted whether that's in um body work you know i've done different things in body work you know i've done massage and, and manipulation and mobilization and rehabilitation and acupuncture and my fascial work and you know it would be very um easy for me to to pin myself on one of them you know and there are practices that are better for one thing than others and there are, are clients that call for one thing or others but actually if i de if i can let go of that labeling and deconstruct all of those things into their elements then i end up with this incredibly rich sort of sea of, of things sea of skills um, and if I can step out of the kind of conditioning of, no, this exists in this box within this frame, if I can yeah. step out of that, then I end up with this beautiful sea, which is, doesn't matter if it's an artistic, something that I've gleaned from an artistic process or from a, uh, a health one or from physiology or from teaching or from um, neuroscience, they're all in play. And that means that when I go into any environment, whether it's any of the different things I do within dance or the different things I do within health, um, I've got the ability to then be really focused on who I'm with. You know, I can put the focus on on holding a space, cultivating an environment and the needs of whoever I'm working with. And the needs of whoever I'm working with might be very direct. If we talk about the life and death situation of an emergency patient, that's very clear what their needs are right mm -hmm. then. If I'm working in dance as a dramaturg or as a choreographer, it's different. If I'm working as a performer, it's different. If I work as a body worker, it's different. So if I can put the needs of who I'm working with first, then what's beautiful is that I kind of visualize it like I get this sort of the path or the kind of the journey builds itself. You know, I've, I've always been an advocate or always for a long time. I've been an advocate of listening to the work, you know, letting the work breathe. I really believe that these creative yeah. processes become if we, if we listen to them enough and if we put enough in them, if we invest enough energetically, they become an entity in and of themselves, you know, and, and choreography is a very concrete way to describe this. You know, you watch the work and if you're able to take a step back and listen to the work and not see what you want it to be, but see what it's really speaking, which is a very difficult thing to do, but a, yeah. but a brilliant process, then the work asks for it what it needs. And if you are constrained by this barrier of, well, I'm this person at the moment, so I, I don't have anything. But if you can let go of those things and, and let everything swim together, then you can go brilliant. Well, it's asking for this and, and here's where I can draw from. These are the resources I have at my at my fingertips. And that's the other that's that that artistic flip of thinking, well, what's needed rather than what do I want? That was a that kind of happened in parallel to my health flip flip of what does this client need? You know, what are the needs of this client and what can I do to facilitate their healing? Yeah. Um, and it's so important that we see it as their healing. You know, I'm, I'm always telling students, I'm not, you're doing, you're the one doing the learning, you're doing the growing. I, my, 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 my class or my, my, my approach is just helping you work out where that needs to happen. And it's the same in healing. My, I'm not healing my clients, you know, I'm using my skills and my physical presence through my hands to tell their body, their nervous system or their spirit. If you, you know, if you believe in that, where to look. 
but it's their body that's doing the healing. And so that, that idea of empowering students, empowering artists, empowering patients, that's something that's true across the board for me. Um, and I, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with, with what you described of trying to use those resources and the intersections of them, let them go into whatever they need to go. And, and if you, if you can prioritize the needs and the, yeah, the, the needs and the perspectives of your, whoever you're working with, the, the community you're in, whether that's a community of two or whether that's a community of, of hundreds, if you can put that first, then I find that my resources can be pulled from yeah. different, different pots and, and serve, serve the aim really. Hmm. Well, wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm very touched. I'm very touched by the language that you have yeah. and the ability to see and put yourself into these intersections. I hear what you're talking about and I feel that at the core of what I at least attempt to do is a sense of service, a sense of being there mm. and applying whatever talents or gifts or uh, trainings I've had or, you know, whatever comes through me to um, to the health, to the well-being, to the composition, even to the arts. So to mm. use, it doesn't negate me. It doesn't negate me as a person or it doesn't um, shrink me necessarily in what I have as skills, but I try to apply them with the sense of service to what is needed in the larger, mm. in the larger sense. And I hear that from you and it's impressive. It's impressive at your young age. I do have to say that again. Absolutely. I doesn't, I hope it's not. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, no, no, not at so all. Much, it's it's exactly that. Thank it's you so much being in sharing. service. My pleasure. Mm. It's been a, such a pleasure. It's been lovely to hear, hear your perspectives and, and have that conversation. Yeah. Wonderful. I hope to meet you in person very soon. Me too. Me Ciao. Bye-bye. If you would like to know more about Holistic Dance and the Holistic Dance Institute, please visit us at our website www.holistic-dance.at. Holistic Dance is an invitation to transformation through dance, movement and touch. It was founded by me, Sabine Parzer, in 2010. It is a mix of different methods, a dynamic cross-method approach from dance pedagogical, dance and body therapeutic, systemic and holistic methods. We offer authentic movement, integrative contact improvisation, somatics and applied anatomy, improvisation, ecosomatics and many more elements. I offer holistic dance workshops, I offer single sessions, I offer teachers trainings, embodiment trainings, advanced teachers tracks, year groups and retreats. I would be very happy to see you at one of our events. And if you have any questions, please write me an email.